Welcome. This week, two United States senators insisted that the Justice Department come clean. Why? Are Wall Street's big banks not only too big to fail, but too big to jail? Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, a Democrat, and Chuck Grassley of Iowa, a Republican, are outraged that the giant banks violate the law with impunity, laundering money, cheating homeowners, falsifying information, every trick in the ledger book. They sent a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder demanding to know why the banks get away with fines instead of jail time. Maybe they had their anger royal by Frontline, public television's premier investigative series. The other night, Frontline broadcast a report called The Untouchables on how the Department of Justice allegedly has looked the other way for fear that prosecuting the banks would do even more damage to the American economy. There was a definite sense that justice backed off. Did the government fail? A number of people told us that you didn't make this a top priority. Well, I'm sorry if they think that because I made it an incredibly top priority. That's Lanny Brewer, the assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division at the Justice Department. A week after the frontline report, he stepped down and is now expected to return to private corporate practice. One more government appointee spinning through the lucrative revolving door between Washington and Wall Street. That door could be a big reason why government treats the banks with kid gloves. A man who once worked for Citigroup, Jack Lew, the president's chief of staff, has been picked to be the new Treasury Secretary. And Mary Jo White, the newly named head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, is a chief litigator at a top law firm representing big investment banks like Morgan Stanley. With all this happening, it's time to talk with journalist Matt Taibbi. You've seen him on our broadcast before. A contributing editor at Rolling Stone, he's been tracking the high crimes and misdemeanors of Wall Street and Washington for years. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. You're working on a story right now to come out in a couple of weeks on the HSBC settlement. That's right. the, tell me about that, why it interests you. Well, the HSBC settlement was was uh, a really shocking kind of new low in the history of, of the too big to fail issue. HSBC was a serial offender uh, on the money laundering score. They had been um, uh, twice given formal cease and desist orders by the government, one dating back as far as 2003, another one in 2010 uh, for inadequately policing uh, the, the accounts in their system. Uh, they uh, laundered over $800 million for, for cartels in Colombia. Drug in cartels. Drug cartels in, in Colombia and Mexico. Uh, they laundered money for uh, terrorist-connected banks uh, in the Middle East, uh, Russian gangsters. Literally, you know, I talked to one prosecutor. It's like they broke basically every law in the book, and they did business with every kind of criminal you can possibly imagine, and they got a complete and total walk. I mean, they had to pay a fine. $1.9 billion, a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but it's, it's five weeks of revenue for the bank, <laughs> to put that in perspective. And no individual had to suffer any consequences at all. There were no, uh, no criminal charges, uh, no individual fines, which was incredible, incredible. Lanny Brewer also forced the Swiss bank UBS, as you know, to pay a big fine in the LIBOR, the price-fixing conspiracy. And, and that outraged you as well, didn't it? This is, this is the, uh, I think, the biggest... Uh, a financial scandal of all time. It was a price fixing scandal where essentially some of the world's biggest banks got together and they conspired uh, illegally to, to uh, artificially rig the uh, uh, global interest rates, uh, which are based upon this, this London interbank offered rate, which is a rate that measures how much it costs for banks to lend money to each other. Uh, this LIBOR rate affects the prices of hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of financial products. And it goes from everything from credit cards to mortgages to municipal bonds. Basically everything in the world, the price is, uh, you know, is somehow connected to LIBOR. And these guys were monkeying around with this for individual profit. And they got, again, a complete and total walk on this. They, there, was, there, were, there were no criminal charges, which is just unbelievable. Did you see the frontline documentary, The Untouchables? I did. Then you're familiar with Lanny Burrow's testimony. You made a reference to losing sleep at night, worrying about what a lawsuit might um, result in uh, at a large financial right. institution. Is that really the job of a prosecutor to worry uh, about anything other than simply pursuing justice? 
Well, I think I am pursuing justice, and I think the, the entire responsibility of the department is to pursue justice. But in any given case, I think I and prosecutors around the country being responsible should speak to regulators, should speak to experts. Because if I bring a case against Institution A, and as a result of bringing that case, there's some huge economic effect. If it creates a ripple effect so that suddenly counterparties and other financial institutions or other companies that had nothing to do with this are affected badly, it's a factor we need to know and understand. Think about what he's saying. He's essentially saying that some individuals are so systemically important that they can't be arrested and put in jail. Now, it's only a few steps forward to the corollary to that, which is if some people are too systemically important to arrest, other people may safely be arrested. So we're creating a class of people who are arrestable and another class of people who are not arrestable, which is crazy. It's a crazy thing for the Assistant Attorney General to say, to admit out loud that he's dividing Americans up into these two classes. There's no reason they couldn't have taken a number of individuals from some of these companies and put them on trial. Uh, historically, uh, we've always done this, even under the Bush administration, if you go back just 10 years, um, you know, WorldCom, Enron, you know, Adelphia, we took the, the leading individuals at these companies and we put them on trial to, 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 to make an example out of them. Uh, and this is exactly what we're not doing in this case. Uh, those companies were systemically important then. Uh, I don't see why uh, they can't do the same thing now. You were shocked when you heard that President Obama had named Mary Jo White to uh, lead the Securities and Exchange Commission. You wrote that she was a partner in a law firm that represented a lot of these big banks. Uh, you know, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Chase, AIG, Morgan Stanley. Uh, you said she dropped out and made the move a lot of regulators make, leaving government to make bucket loads of money working for the people she used to police. And I gather your great concern is that you don't want to see the country's top financial cop being indebted to the people who created the, 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 the bankroll. Right. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's just simple common sense. I mean, if you're sitting on 10 million, 15 million dollars, however much money she made working there at Deborah Waz and Plimpton when she was a partner, uh, and you owe that money to this specific group of, of clients, um, and now you're in charge of policing them, just psychologically think about it. It doesn't really work, you know? It doesn't really work in terms of how aggressive a prosecutor should be, how, what his attitude towards um, you know, the people he's supposed to be policing uh, should be. It's just, it, the, the circumstances just aren't quite right. You'd much rather see a career civil servant in that, in that situation. She was once a tough pro prosecutor. What's your beef? Well, uh, you know, I, I have people who are telling me that I'm wrong about this, that Mary Jo White was an excellent prosecutor and she's, she's a good choice. But, um, you know, I also, I, I've done uh, stories in the past about uh, an episode. You had a, a, an SEC investigator named Gary Aguirre who was pursuing an insider trading case against the future CEO of Morgan Stanley. Um, he asked for permission to, to interview uh, that future CEO. His name was John Mack. Uh, it was denied. And it was because there was communication between Morgan Stanley's lawyer, who at the time was Mary Jo White, uh, and the higher-ups at the SEC, uh, who included the director of enforcement, Linda Thompson. Um, Aguirre was later fired uh, for complaining about having this investigation squelched. Blowing uh, the whistle. For, for blowing the whistle. Uh, but the SEC was later forced to pay a $750,000 wrongful termination suit to, to Aguirre. Uh, in that case. But what's so interesting is that Aguirre's boss, the guy who, who killed that case, went to work for Mary Jo White's firm nine months after the case died uh, and he got you know, a multi-million dollar position. It's a classic example of how the revolving door works in Washington. You, know, you have these regulators at the SEC and they know that there's that job out there waiting for them. So how hard are they really going to uh, regulate these companies? when they know they can get that money. Um, but in Washington, you know, people kind of shake their heads at it because it's so common, uh, you know, that these, these people, they, they move from government back to, you know, these high-priced uh, legal defense firms uh, that represent the banks, and then they go back to government again, and it's just sort of this coterie of, of, you know, 100, 200 lawyers who really run this entire yeah. thing, and it's all the same people on, on both sides. Lanny Brewer was one of them. He was in a very prestigious uh, Washington law firm. Jack Lew, the incoming Secretary of the Treasury, if he gets approved, served three years at Citi mm -hmm. uh, Group. His record there, according to the Wall Street Journal, was not very uh, 
uh, lustrous for a man who's about to take over the Treasury Department, but the Wall Street Journal uh, suggests that he got his job, not because he had the experience, but because he was a crony of Robert Rubin. Jack Lew was back. He, he served in the Clinton administration. I think he worked in the OMB, in the you know, Office of Management of the Budget. Um, and he, uh, was in, he was one of the key players in helping pass the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the way it works. It's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, obvious connection. But, you know, Glass-Steagall was repealed specifically to legalize the merger of Citigroup. Uh, and, you know, coincidentally, Bob Rubin, who was the tre Treasury Secretary, and Jack Lew end up working at Citigroup, a few, you know, five, ten years later, and they make enormous amounts of money, and then they go back to government. And again, this is just sort of this merry-go-round that everybody in Washington knows about, and that's the way it works. How do you explain President Obama's attitude in this? When he was running for president, he promised to close the revolving door, and he seemed genuinely shocked at the collapse of the financial system and the bank's role in it. But he also was raking in massive campaign contributions from these uh, very people. Did those investments, did those contributions turn out to be good investments, or do you think he's just overwhelmed by the system that's controlled by these guys? I think that they genuinely uh, accept the explanation that they're probably hearing from all these people who, who run these Wall Street companies. Um, you know, people like Bob Rubin and, and Larry Summers, who are close confidants of the Obama administration, um, are probably telling them, look, if we start prosecuting all kinds of people for, for you know, X, Y, and Z, there's going to be major instability in the markets. People are going to flee uh, America. They're going to withdraw capital from the American financial system. It'll be a disaster. Jobs will be lost. But it's just not an acceptable uh, explanation. I think they're... Why? You know, well, just because the rule of law isn't really the rule of law if it doesn't apply equally to everybody. I mean, if you're going to put somebody in jail for having a, a joint in his pocket, you can't let high-ranking HSBC officials off for laundering $800 million for the, the worst drug dealers in the entire world. People who are suspected not only of dealing drugs, but of thousands of murders. I mean, this is a, an incredible uh, dichotomy. And eventually, you know, it eats away at the very fabric of society when, when some people go to jail and some people don't go to jail. But do you ever have the sense that those guys are, are you know, are, and their lawyers are up there laughing at, at all of us uh, on their way to the bank? No, no pun intended. I mean, the fact of the matter is they are immune. This, the, what the, the, there was a story in the Washington Post the other day by Howard Schneider and Daniel Douglas with the lead. Five years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a global push to tighten financial regulation around the world has slowed in the face of a tepid recovery, which the banks helped bring on, and a tough industry lobbying effort. Big banks, insurers, and other financial giants remain intact and arguably too big to fail. I mean, nothing really has changed. No, no, definitely not. And, the, and if, in fact, if you want to look at it uh, objectively, since 2008, um, you know, the companies that we're talking about have become bigger and more dangerous and, and more, more immune to prosecution than they were back then. And you might even say by a lot. I mean, uh, you know, the first factor was that you had a series of mergers in 2008, which, you know, made companies like Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase um, you know, double in size, or they were, they were much bigger than they were before. Uh, so therefore, they're more dangerous. Um, and so you have these companies like Barclays, like Royal Bank of Scotland, like UBS, like HSBC, which are, you know, we, they can't be regulated. We, we can't get an accurate accounting of what's going on in their books. Um, and apparently now we can't even criminally prosecute them for laundering money like HSBC does. I mean, uh, we just keep setting the bar lower and lower and lower, and it's, it's, it's getting scary, I think. There's a new analysis out just the other day from the Economic Policy Institute that shows the super rich have done well in the economic recovery while almost everyone else has done badly. And the economist Robert Rice says, we're back to the widening inequality we had before the big crash. Are the financial and political worlds just too intertwined and powerful for anything to change? I mean, it's, it's a concern. I, I would worry about it, but it doesn't mean you can't you know, try to stop the problem. I, I definitely think, though, that there is this connection now between political power and financial power that's just becoming more and more overt. I mean, what, what uh, Lanny Brewer is saying in that video is uh, these people who have an enormous amount of power, destructive financial power, uh, we can't prosecute them. 
Uh, on the flip side, what, what, they're, what they're essentially saying is that people who don't have any money at all, um, it's politically safe uh, uh, to put them in jail. Um, and so, you know, we're creating this, this kind of dual class, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very upsetting and disturbing situation. Matt Tybee, we'll be looking forward to your next expose in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me on.